Ken Ham, the best known young earth creationist, has spent a large amount of effort the last couple months talking about and warning other young earth creationists about the influence of evolutionary biology or what he calls young earth evolution within the young earth creationist myths. He claims that certain individuals are being influenced by evolutionary theory and therefore sort of imbibing evolutionary ideas and importing them into young earth creationism, either intentionally or unintentionally. Well, I'm here to tell you that Ken Ham himself has imbibed some of those evolutionary ideas and incorporated them into his own language, his own terminology, and his own beliefs, therefore making him a young earth evolutionist. Joel, what are you talking about? Of course, Ken Ham doesn't believe in evolution. Now, what I'm going to do, the task I've set out for myself here, is to show you using his words and his definition of what makes a young earth evolutionist and a young earth evolutionist. By those definitions, he himself is a young earth evolutionist. How am I going to do that? We're going to look at some of what he says about the dog kind or the canines, about speciation, and we're going to look at his definition, or at least his organization's definition, of what a young earth evolutionist is. So we're going to start with a tweet that he uh, he made very recently. Um, that's also, I believe, become a blog post. And then we'll work our way into some other things that he said. And along the way, we're going to learn a lot about canines and the amount of genetic difference between the different species of canines. So let's find out. What does Ken Ham mean by young earth evolutionist and how is Ken Ham a young earth evolutionist? We've got that coming right up. I was going to mention this on, young, on my This Week in Creationism, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that this is a really important point. And so I need to, I need to focus on it and bring in a few other examples. And it just turned into the, what, what is now going to be this entire video. So it was this, I was spurred to think about this and to say something about it when I saw this tweet just a few weeks ago. Here's Ken Ham saying, at a conference I was at recently, one of the audience found it hard to believe that only two dogs from the dog kind were needed on Noah's Ark to give rise to the 34 dog species we have today. No kidding. I'm not surprised that somebody in his audience found that a little bit curious. That's a head scratcher. You've got two dogs, two canines. I prefer to say canines versus dogs. I think of dogs as really just domesticated dogs uh, or domesticated wolves. But we'll use his language here for a moment. Two dogs are on the Ark. And from those two dogs who they got off the, the ark, they then had the capacity within them to, um, to author, all right, 34 dog species that we have today. Now, what he doesn't mention here is there's also another 100 different species of dogs or canines that are extinct, right? They're known from the fossil record, but that fossil record is in the post-flood record, and therefore also are the descendants of the dogs that got off the ark. So I would think he should really be saying of the 130 or so species of dogs that we know of today, all were derived from two dogs just 3,400 years ago. I used high school genetics to give the big picture to the audience to understand, and I'll show you the rest of this phrase in just a moment, but let's back up. I used high school genetics. Now, I don't want to sound flippant here, and this is, this is not meant to be a joke. He used high school genetics because that's the extent of his knowledge. Ken Ham doesn't know anything more than high school genetics, and I'm not sure he understands high school genetics either. But for him to be able to explain this, he's using high school genetics, and that's a big problem because understanding the true diversity of organisms like canines requires a greater knowledge, much greater knowledge of genetics than simply high school genetics. And to think that you can explain this using high school genetics a hundred some species coming from two individuals is um, it, it's just ridiculous. Let's read the rest of his tweet, his extended tweet, and then we'll get down into the details, pull out some data about canines and sort of try to dig into what's really going on here. 
So I used high school genetics to give the big picture to the audience to understand when God created each animal kind, he created tremendous genetic diversity within each kind to enable immense numbers of combinations of genes. Right. I'm here to do a little bit of criticism of his genetics knowledge or lack of knowledge, but I'm more interested in this aspect of why does he, how did he come to believe things that he's stating here? Let's really analyze this sentence. High school genetics, big picture, audience to understand that God created each animal kind. All right, so he thinks from the scriptures that God created the kinds, right? I think he could point to scriptures and he could say that um, there is a word which we would interpret as kind. And so we'd say, yes, scriptures tells Ken Ham and other Christians, including myself, that God created kinds. He's the author of kinds of organisms. Now we could go into a long discussion about what exactly is a kind. All right, not gonna do that right now. We need to go to the next clause. He created tremendous genetic diversity within each kind. I have a question for Ken Ham here. How does he know? Can he point to a scripture reference that says that God created uh, immense genetic diversity in the original kinds. Does God tell us that directly through some kind of prophecy? Does he tell us that indirectly through any of the words of any of the authors of scripture, that the original created individuals or the original created kinds had tremendous genetic diversity? I'm gonna ask it, I'm gonna say it multiple times during this talk, was Ken Ham there? Did he witness those original kinds? Did he genetically analyze those original kinds? Does he have their genome sequence? Can he compare that genome sequence with the genome sequence today? No, he has neither scriptural evidence, nor does he have any physical evidence from his own direct observations. Remember, he, he, he doesn't believe in historical science, or at least the effectiveness of historical science. It's all about observations in the present. You weren't there, how do you know? Right? He says that all the time to his audience. I'm going to ask him, how do you know? How do you know they're a creative genetic diversity? You just followed up a sentence in which is speaking something that I think you can be 100% sure of because you can say this is the authority of Scripture. It tells us that God created each animal kind. You're not defining a kind, but you are at least speaking the truth that God created kinds. And you're following that statement up with God created tremendous genetic diversity. A statement which is not based on the authority of scripture. It's not known to you because of direct revelation. You're somehow inferring that. And what we're gonna ask is, how does he infer this? How is he so confident in this? There's going to be multiple times that we're going to go through this talk, multiple times in which we're going to find out that Ken Ham bases his authority and his confidence in secular science. It's not, it has nothing to do with the scriptures. He believes the secular science. Okay, so that's the first point. Ken Ham elevates statements to being scriptural that are not scriptural. They are not from scripture. They're his own opinion. His opinion is God created tremendous genetic diversity in each kind to enable immense numbers of combinations of genes. That's his opinion, right? And he might infer it from some sort of scientific study somewhere that this is possible. This is a hypothesis. He's placing a hypothesis next to scriptural authority and equating the two and making them equal. All right, that's problem number one. As the two dogs came off the ark and increased in number, over time, groups split off moving to different areas and became isolated from other groups. All this is not stated as a hypothesis. This is stated as, here's what happened. Again, Ken Ham wasn't there. He did not witness this. He does not have a videotape of this happening. He does not have anything in scripture that says this is what these dogs did doesn't have anything in scripture that say there were two dogs on the ark, two of every kind. He doesn't know if these dogs are a single kind or whether all these different species we're going to talk about are different kinds. He cannot know that because scripture does not tell him that. 
due to enormous due to the enormous amount of genetic diversity God had created in their DNA. Again, <laughs> he is stating this as if it's a fact, as if he knows, based on the authority of Scripture, this is a true statement. He does not know that. Um, in parentheses there, evolution can't account for such information, which cannot arise from matter by natural processes. That's typical boroplant language that he includes, which he's wrong about. Over time, different combinations of genes in each group survive better than others due to the conditions. In other words, the environment selected certain combinations of genes in certain individuals, allowing them to survive and others not to. Therefore, those organisms were better adapted to that environment. He's talking about natural selection and adaptation. As a result, different species of dogs formed. So through some process of selecting genes fit for environments, that then creates different species. Right? That's all evolutionary language. This is all, this is all what Darwin talked about. All right? But of course, there's still dogs. Now, now remember, his word for dog means all canines. And we're going we're gonna to talk about the kind, the broader kind, in just a moment and talk about what does he mean by that. And they're all related to other dogs and all part of the dog kind. So a wolf and a coyote are related to each other, right? Related by common ancestry. Again, Ken Ham has never seen that ancestor. He doesn't have any um, historical record of anyone who has reported it faithfully, like been inspired by God to write down and, and tell us about the ancestor of wolves and coyotes. He is trusting modern science and the interpretations of evolutionary biology specifically to understand how those two have a common ancestor. All right, but I'm not even really gotten close to how Ken Ham really is a young earth evolutionist. What I'm saying kind of sounds that way, but we haven't even got to the big stuff yet. We're leading up to it still. On deck of the Ark Encounter attraction, Exhibit explains that most all Mo Noah needed was just 1,300 animal kinds on the Ark, which meant there was plenty of room to take representatives of each kind of land-dwelling, air-breathing animals on board. I'm sure that's one of the concerns of his audience, and of course he always says that, right? There was plenty of room because we only needed two dogs. Even though you look around, there's 34 different species and millions of dogs today. We only got them from just two individuals. No problem. I can just use high school genetics to explain it. And he just does right here. That's how your high school genetics. That's the extent of his knowledge of genetics you've just seen. And he has a presentation called Basic Genetics and, and, and the Animal Kinds and specifically dogs. And he doesn't go really any further than what he says in this paragraph right here. All right now, part of that tweet, he shows a number of images. I just want to explain why he's showing these images and what he means by them. So this is his illustration of the original dog kind having presumably lots of genetic variation. And then that original dog kind bifurcates into different subpopulations, which have different subsets of variation from the original pool of variation. So he's, he's treating as if there's this huge amount of variation in the original kind which may be individuals or maybe a large population that God originally created. But it kind of doesn't matter whether it's individuals or a large population. They got shrunk down to just two individuals on the ark, right? So all the species we have today have to come from just two individuals on the ark. So not only is he really, he really imp he's implying, he doesn't actually say this very often in talks. Um, he says that God created him with tremendous genetic variation, but he also has to imply that somehow that genetic variation was maintained by God through the first 1,500 years of history to the point of the flood and then preserved through the flood because he needs that genetic variation because he always talks about that genetic variation being what is selected upon to create all the species after the flood. So there's, there's actually more there than just you got original like de novo creation of genetic variation. You also have preservation probably miraculously of that variation through the flood and then somehow just natural mechanisms after that generate all these different species and what do you get you get all this kind of variation right gray wolves coyotes so this is what he's calling the dog kind german shepherds poodles which are just variations of of uh, wolves gray wolves uh, bush dogs jackals dingoes now what's missing here is he doesn't have a uh, he doesn't have the uh, foxes, right? There's a number of different foxes here, but he also includes those in the dog kind. 
Now, it'd be better to call that the canid kind, all right, because it's the member of the family called the canidae in our, in our modern taxonomic language. And this is a, a screenshot from the Ken Ham Bill Nye debate. And in that debate, Ken Ham is explaining his view of origins, the origin of species. And kinds are created by God. Species are created by secondary processes that God put in place in order to allow organisms to adapt to this world, which are natural selection and genetic drift and all same mutations, increasingly so accepted by uh, young Earth creationists. So I just want to I just want to show you that here we are. Ken Ham is saying there's a dog kind, the Kennedy, and what is that? It includes the foxes and the Canis genus, a different group of the Canids. And he's missing actually three other different genera that are here, but they're all included that. And if you go to the Ark Encounter, the same Canidae is just one family that's found on the Ark. So all of those different genera are included in this. All right, and then, so he's imagining that uh, two dogs got off and then they quickly diversified into foxes versus, we'll call them the wolf kinds, or the wolf variations. And then those wolves end up, you end up with uh, coyotes, wolves, and canis lupus, the gray wolf. And from the gray wolf, you then get domesticated dogs and dingoes and the Eurasian wolf and so forth. All right, so all that genetic variation, all of this is all included in one kind and so originated from that one kind. Now, as I often say, that's an enormous amount of evolution. All right, just that is macroevolution. That is speciation, right? Lots of speciation going on and there's a lot of new uh, changes in the genetics, there's mutations, there's all kinds of stuff. Any evolutionary biologist is gonna look at that and say, that's evolution, right? You've just de described evolution happening. Ken Ham has a different definition of evolution. He'll say that that's not evolution. We're not getting into that debate today. We're sticking to how he's a young earth evolutionist and he is employing young earth, uh, I'm sorry, employing evolutionary concepts and ideas in his own language, maybe without realizing it. So now what I'm gonna do is I'll show you at the Creation Museum, there's a big display about the dog kind and about speciation. And here is the exact text that's on that display. I don't. I have a picture of it, but I'm not going to show it because they don't. He has. Uh, he doesn't. I'm going to honor the fact that they don't want photography used for anything but personal purposes, or personal uses. I've got thousands of pictures from the Creation Museum, but I'm, I'm not showing them here. But I have copied the text. Right. So here's the text from that sign. Variation within the dog kind, which again means the canine canine group or canine family. Two types of selection, nat natural and artificial, are the mechanisms that have led to the many different types that exist today. It has been determined genetically that all dogs, wolves, coyotes, foxes there, see, jackals, dingoes, and domesticated dogs are related to each other. This is the central sentence that I'm going to focus on. This is my main piece of evidence. Right, so let's read this over again. It has been determined genetically that all dogs are related to each other. Now first, look at the references. Reference six and seven. We go down here and we look at reference six and seven. Reference six, multiple and ancient origins of the domesticated dog. The reference number seven, genomic sequence, comparative analysis, and haplotype structure of the domesticated dog. I have looked at both of those papers. Both of those papers talk about all kinds of variation within domesticated dogs and how that, that variation may have come from wolves, but wolves are just sort of mentioned on the side. It's really about the diversification and genetic diversity of domesticated dogs. There's nothing about foxes, jackals, dingoes, coyotes, the broader group of canines in those papers. So those are inappropriate references to start out with, right? Those references do not back up his claim, right? Those references do not provide the genetic information that proves that all dogs are related to each other, that all canines are related by common ancestry. Now, that's not to say that there aren't plenty of other papers, right? A hundred other papers <laughs> that talk about the different kinds of dog species or canine species and how they might be related to each other, 
right? What's their family tree, right? How long ago, how, you know, what, what order did they diversify and so forth? And how did they migrate across different places? There's lots and lots of research on that. Lots of genetics have been done. So you should have been able to find better references. What's my main point though here? <sighs> They've been determined genetically that all dogs are related to each other. So how does Ken Ham know that all these different canines share a common ancestor and that common ancestor was on the ark? He knows because it's been determined by genetics, not the Bible. He has no biblical reference, no biblical reference here or in other articles to demonstrate that coyotes and wolves and foxes are the same kind and that they share a common ancestor. How does he know they weren't separately created? How does he know that they weren't different kinds? How does he know? He knows because genetically it's been shown they're related to each other. What does related mean? It means they share a common ancestor. It means they have evolved from a common ancestor. Kenham is pointing to genetics and saying the genetics prove that these different dogs are related to one another. He's totally fallen for evolution. If evolution had never, if Darwin and others had never derived the hypothesis of evolution of common ancestry, and eventually we hadn't looked at genes and used genetic information to figure out how organisms are related, right? Ken Ham has a, and, and others say, like, what if Darwin had never existed? What would the world look like? What would we think? And that's what he wants. We, we want to return to a world in which we never knew about Darwin because that's totally influenced our thinking. Ken Ham's been influenced by, Ken, by, by Darwin. He's completely influenced by modern understandings of genetics, of, of evolutionary biology. He's saying, I know that these dogs, jackals, foxes, coyotes, they look really different. They're different species. Many of these cannot interbreed. He can't point to interbreeding and say, oh, because they interbreed, they're the same kind. He doesn't even point to that evidence. He doesn't try to even allude to that evidence, most of which doesn't exist, right? No, he says genetics prove that they're related to one another. And what, how, what assumption do geneticists use when they look at two different sequences? They say these are different sequences, but they're similar. And so we can imagine that they once shared the same sequence and that those sequences have accumulated mutations. Where there was a pool of genetic variation, that variation was sorted out by uh, natural selection into different species. All right, so... Those are all evolutionary ideas. Those are all assumptions of evolution that he's importing in and telling his audience right there on the wall at the Creation Museum, how do we know that organisms are related to each other? Because of genetics. Now, if he wants to say that, he cannot criticize someone else for coming along and saying, dogs and cats share similar genetics too. And I could make a genetic argument that they're related to one another. And Ken Ham can't stop anyone either from saying that chimpanzees and humans are more similar genetically to each other than some foxes are to wolves, right? There's a very strong genetic argument to be made there based on evolutionary assumptions, All right? And so I, I'm just going to keep saying this because you have to repeat it. Ken Ham is pointing to genetics and he is imbibing evolutionary ideas, incorporating them into the language that's expressed on the walls of the Creation Museum. And he is telling other young earth creationists, bad on you for using evolutionary language and being, and being corrupted by evolutionary ideas. When he and his organization is using evolutionary assumptions to draw conclusions. Let me show you. So here's the recent um, series on young earth evolution, a series of 11 articles published every, every week, one every week in the earlier part of this year. And halfway through, after receiving a lot of feedback, 
Ken Ham stepped in and kind of summarized what's happening here and sort of like, here's why we're doing this and why it's important. So we're pausing and we're going to warn those who are upset that we need to just simmer out and understand our motives here. Hmm. And he notes here, even a small error can unlock the door leading to a major issue. What are those small errors? Spending considerable time in discussion with our researchers at Answers in Genesis. So he's saying as a group, uh, my organization, we got all got together, all these um, expert PhDs we, I've got employed by me. I don't know any genetics myself, but presumably I have people who know genetics that I've hired. And they have found what they call young earth evolution ideas. Places where creationists have accepted some false evolutionary assumptions. And what has that done? That's led to what we believe is error in a number of areas that we believe and teach. We think that this is creating error within our midst, our midst being the, the wider young earth creationist community, because obviously it's not happening at Answers in Genesis, because he has firm control on those employees. And those employees have decided, here's where everyone else is erring, right? So now what do I have highlighted here? So this current series of articles on young earth evolution has an overarching thing of, re of responding to instances in which we believe some creationist researchers have, for unknown reasons, accepted various secular evolutionary assumptions unnecessarily. We believe this is, an this is opening a door to undermine biblical authority and could lead to others accepting more evolutionary assumptions and eventually giving up on biblical authority. This is the slippery slope concept. Okay, it doesn't sound too bad what they're doing, but if they continue to let in more and more and more, this is this is a wrong idea, and they've let it slip in, and they're going to let more slip in, they're going to let more slip in, and eventually they're going to give up on biblical authority. The Bible says God created, you know, kinds, and they're not at all related to one another. But maybe those kinds are bigger than we think. Because evolutionary ideas tell us that, right, this is what other young earth evolutionists are doing, or at least what the problem is. Maybe a kind could be like all whales. And maybe whales have ancestors that may have actually walked on land at one time. And so a kind could be a larger amount of change that has occurred, but it's still within one group that God made with a common, with a common ancestor. And answers just like that's absolutely can't happen. That's like that's impossible. You're, you've you've looked at evolutionary biology, and they're trying to convince you that whales came from the land, and therefore you're taking in their assumptions, and you're broadening your definition of a kind. You're allowing all this evolution to seep in. What has Ken Ham done? What has Ken Ham done? Right? He says, let's look at all these dogs. There's a tremendous amount of, oh, I'm going to show you the variation in dogs pretty soon here, canines. There's a tremendous amount of genetic variation. Lots of different morphologies. Live in lots of different habitats. Right? And if Ken Ham lived 500 years ago, he would have thought you were crazy if you said all those things were actually the same thing. Right? They're all related by common ancestry. Anathema. You know, that's, that's, that's heretical. But Ken Ham is convinced, not because the Bible tells him that those are all one kind. He's convinced because genetics tells them it's all one kind. The genetic evidence is so powerful. The assumptions of common ancestry and seeing the similarities in their genomes convince him that, yes, you could go back and see how they could have all come from one genome. Let me remind you, Ken Ham was not there. He did not see the original dog. He did not see the original genome. He can't know it had like all this genetic variation in it. Besides, there was only two dogs on the ark. There's only so much genetic variation you can fit in there. I know he thinks that you can have a lot of genetic variation, this heterozygosity idea, created heterozygosity thing. That idea is ridiculous you start looking at actual genetic diversity, all right, and interactions in the genome, and the fact that diversity is on different chromosomes. I mean, there's so many things that you really have to get a far more advanced degree in genetics to really be able to explain. And I have trouble actually communicating some of those ideas. 
um, because it takes a lot of background knowledge in order to build up to that. Okay, so Cunningham is saying, look, um, these are obviously all the same kind because they're similar to one another and they look similar to me and genetically they're kind of similar and genetics has determined that they actually are related. Eh, genetics has not determined that. Inferences from genetics have determined, but inference using what? <laughs> Evolutionary assumptions. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> get him. You're a product of evolution, right? You're a product of evolutionary theory. You've sucked it up. You've accepted those results. Um, okay, let's continue. This is another tweet. This is from 2018. I used this in a paper that I wrote about macroevolution, microevolution, and misunderstandings and creationism about this. Uh, and this was the tweet that inspired me to write that peer-reviewed article. <laughs> this is the tweet that sent me on that mission to, to delve into that. The wolf and the coyote are different species. I agree. And evolutionists claim this took thousands of years. Uh, no, the I think it's more like 350 to 500,000 years. Somewhere, somewhere in that range is sort of the the um, generally accepted time range. Uh, I guess you could say that's thousands of years, but it, for his audience, he's underplaying the time, right? Thousands of years. Yet, the differences between the Great Dane and the Yorkshire Terrier are much greater. But they're the same species, and they were known to have been bred in just the last few hundred years. Look how different they are, and they're only a couple hundred years old, and they're the same species. Evolution's bankrupt. Now, this tweet is ridiculous in so many ways, but the biggest problem here is he's reading a book by its cover. He thinks that he can just look at things and know how different they are. Well, if your definition of different is visually what they look like, external appearance, I'll grant you a Great Dane and Yorkshire Terrier look more different from one another than a wolf and a coyote. But that would kind of be like, if I held up a copy of Mein Kampf and the Bible, right? But they were had the same covers, right? Just different texts on them, and the binding was the same and all that. In other words, if you just laid them out on, on, the, uh, on a table, you'd say they sure look pretty similar to one another. But you know if you opened those two books and you read them, and you looked inside, you would not agree that those two things are more similar to one another than, say, two copies of, you know, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. My son collects different versions of Lord of the Rings uh, text, and he's got ones printed in different ways with different kinds of covers and different cover art and so forth. So they look dramatically different. Right? Ken Ham would come into that book, books, look at those books and go like, look how different those, you know, Lord of the Rings is from each other. They're totally different. Whereas the Bible and Mein Kampf are the same. <laughs> it's like, because he reads the books by their cover. No understanding of the overall meaning of genetic divergence or how different organisms are from one another. After all, anatomically and external morphology, chimps and humans aren't terribly different from one another compared to a lot of other things either. So I don't think he wants to just go with external appearances. Anyway, this is a, a, a just a, a, a crazy argument because he's mistaking the effects of just a few genes. Great Danes and Yorkshire Terriers are 99.999% similar in terms of their overall genome, how they function, their behaviors. Their, I mean, you go down the list, everything except for a few anatomical features that are fur, right, and tail, and things like that, right? That's just a couple genes. A couple genes with a couple variants create enormous looking differences. But the organisms are really very similar. And we know that, I mean, they easily crossbreed with one another. Whereas wolves and coyotes, eh, they crossbreed, but boy, they sure don't, they don't like to, and they're not, they don't make a very successful crossbreed. Let's get into the genetics, right? So let's, let's just think about like, 
how much evolution is Ken Ham talking about? How much is he accepting? Has he thought about what he's saying when he just so glibly says, genetically, they're all related? Here is a phylogenetic tree showing relationships of a number of different major members, actually all the living members of canines. And we're especially interested here in the number of chromosomes. Oh, maybe I'll first point out, uh, so here's Canis lupus. Canis familiaris is sometimes domesticated dogs are given their own, uh, uh, their own species name. Sometimes it's Canis lupus variety familiaris, just to show how similar they are. And then here's Canis latrans, that's your coyote. Right? And then there's other canine, uh, 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 Canis genera. But there's also Lycolopex, right, a different genus. And then you've got uh, Volpes up here. These are your, your, your foxes, right, including the, the, the red fox up there. Uh, and then you have another genus, and here's another genus. Uh, and way down here, you're a scion. That's the gray fox. Okay, those are the gray foxes. All right, so there's a bunch of different recognized genera. Now, genera are usually recognized by the fact that they're, there's some significant difference between member species of those and the member species of another genus. And then, of course, the family itself represents a, a much larger, broader groups of genetic diversity. Now, do you know something about this figure? Now, let me, let me, here's the chromosome numbers. Uh, 78 chromosomes. You and I have 46 chromosomes, but don't get hung up on numbers. Uh, numbers, just the number of total distinct chromosomes. Uh, it's not about the total size because some chromosomes are larger and some are smaller. So the genome size of an organism with 78 chromosomes may be smaller than an organism with 46 chromosomes. And actually, the genome size of a dog is very similar to the genome size of a human, even though we have 46 chromosomes. All right, so you can see that a lot of members of Canis have 78. A question mark just means it hasn't been done yet. They haven't looked at it. We don't know. But you see 78, 78, 78, 78, 78, 78, 78. All right, so that's a, that's a nice group of things that have 78 chromosomes. And all members of Canis are pretty similar to each other. Like you recognize that wolves and coyotes are similar to each other. And so we, we suggest genetically, based not just on chromosome numbers, but lots of other genes, their similarity suggests that all these you can put into a family group, right? And that group all has 78 chromosomes. Why doesn't Canham just say Canis is a, is a, you know, again, he'd be arguing based on genetics, but genetically, that's a group, right? It has a common ancestor. How does he know that this common ancestor wasn't on the ark? And it's separately created by God. Uh, but no, what he's saying is, here is the ancestor of canines. And he believes that all these canines are related by common ancestry. So they start out with just two individuals on the ark. Those two then turn into different populations. And as they spread across the world, they turned into all these different species. And what had to happen during that time as well? The chromosome numbers obviously changed, right? Canis has 78 chromosomes, it's pretty consistent. But let's look up here at the, at the foxes. Uh, here we have 50. Here's another fox that's related to it. It has 36. Here's a fox, Volpes, all right, red fox. It has 34 chromosomes. We'll get to the bees in a moment. And here's uh, Rupelii, a very similar species, kind of like foxes and, I mean, sorry, it's like coyotes and wolves. But it has 40 chromosomes, six more chromosomes. Here we have uh, another genus of canines that has 64 chromosomes. The 2n, by the way, means diploid. You and I are diploids as well. We're 2n equals 46, which means you have 23 chromosomes from each parent. You have 23 chromosomes. You have two copies of each one. So a dog that has 36 chromosomes has 18 chromosomes, and they have duplicates, right? Or got 18 from mom, 18 from dad. If you have 50, you got 25 and 25 and so forth. That's why they're all even numbers, too, because it's hard to have an odd number uh, and sort them out right when you're reproducing. So you should be asking yourself this question. How do they get different chromosome numbers? Isn't that, like, hard to do? 
I'm sure I didn't do this as part of our research. So I'm not going to show this to you, but we could go into the Young Earth Creationist literature and we could find statements about one organism having a different chromosome number and being skeptical that you could ever tr turn one of those species into another one because they'd have to go through some transition where they lost chromosomes or they fused chromosomes together and drawing up a scenario for how they fused and what individual and how that would happen, how they'd find another individual. All right, it gets complicated. But one thing's for sure. Ken Ham believes that you can gain chromosomes and you can lose chromosomes. You can change chromosome numbers through time. This is not genetic sorting. Ken Ham talks about in his high school level genetics, you have lots of variation. And you take that variation and you kind of just sort it out into different groups. And natural selection selects different members in those groups to survive. And there you get different species. What I'm saying here is, if you start with two dogs, uh, maybe one had two more chromosomes than the other. Uh, let's just grant him the most conservative way of approaching this. Maybe the two dogs had two different sets of chromosomes. Fine. Even so, you're not going to get all these different numbers of chromosomes. Look down here. We've got 66. We have 74, 78, 40. In other words, Ken Ham has to propose. I haven't, I haven't seen this theory yet. I haven't seen anyone show how this is happening. I haven't seen any creationist draw out a scenario, a hypothesis for how you went from a particular set of chromosomes. Now, you'll notice that uh, evolutionary biologists think that the original canine probably had about 82 chromosomes. Now, that happens to be from a comparison also with other carnivores. Um, and that would definitely be an evolutionary assumption. So if Ken Ham wants to use that 82 number, he is using evolutionary assumptions, all right? <laughs> yeah, so, and so therefore, he's a young Earth evolutionist if he does that. Um, so whether it's 82, 78, or whatever, the general trend is some loss of chromosomes. But I want to tell you that's not a loss of information. It's not a loss of genes. What's happened here is chromosomes have broken into like two chromosomes. One chromosome is broken into two. Um, Oh, sorry, that would actually increase the number of chromosome numbers. Chromosomes have fused with each other. So two chromosomes have fused together to form just one chromosome. And that's how you can reduce 82 down to 78. To reduce it all the way down to 40, you have to have a lot of fusions. And so you have different foxes. One fox has 50, another one has 40, another one has 34 chromosomes. That's a huge number difference. Now, what do you hear young earth creationists discuss all the time if you're talking about chromosome numbers? They'll talk about like how uh, chimpanzees have 48 chromosomes. Humans have 46 chromosomes total. And they'll say that that is one of the, the obvious reasons why the two can't be related, right? Because you can't change the chromosome number. Well, you cannot make that argument if you're going to believe and accept this particular phylogeny which Ken Ham apparently accepts. This is, this is the genetic evidence that they're related to one another. Actually, the chromosomes aren't, but the, the, the rest of the tree is based on sequence. Obviously, chromosome numbers can change, and obviously chromosomes can, can, can be fused. And if you go into these different dogs, not all of them have been researched thoroughly, but some of them we know, like, here's chromosome this and chromosome that. Oh, yeah, look down at this paper here where I, where I drew this example from. Comparative chromosome painting in Carnivora and Philodota. Uh, so in the current, and I'm only showing you the carnivore, that there's lots of chromosome changes in other carnivores as well, right? This is not unique to canines. Uh, chromosome painting means they're looking at uh, the different order of genes on different chromosomes. And what they show is like, uh, you know, if an organism has 38 chromosomes and another one has 36 chromosomes, well, where did the two chromosomes go to in the one that's 36? Well, they're just the ones that had 38 two of them combined. And how do they know they combined? Because those two, there's a new chromosome that has like all of everything from one chromosome and all the other thing from another chromosome. And the two are stuck together. It's, it's exactly what chromosome two is in human beings. It's the same information that's on two separate chromosomes in chimpanzees and the chromosomes stuck together in human beings. All right. So here is your proof. Ken Ham says that all of these canines came from two individuals, and therefore, he believes that chromosome can fuse. 
and they fuse frequently. And they divide frequently as well. They can show you lots of examples where they increase in numbers uh, in other groups. All right, so that's chromosome number. And I want to emphasize that does not fit with his sorting genetic variation because you can't have chromosome variation really in the original creation uh, if it's being bottlenecked by, the, by Noah's flood. So that to me is a, a simple example of showing how naive his genetic variation is great at the beginning and then it's just sorted out over time. Uh, there's many more complex reasons that would take a lot of explanation, but I think that one's fairly clear. Now let's just look at some other canines. Uh, here's a this is 2023. This is just a couple weeks ago. Uh, published a genomic assessment of gray fox lineages, not not the red fox vulpes lineages. These are the uh, gray foxes, and there's a gray fox lineage of that lives in the eastern U.S. and there are western gray foxes. And the question was, are gray foxes from the east and the west, are they really all one species or are they two species or how much segregation have they experienced? So they sequenced whole genomes, portions of sequence from a, a number of other individuals of gray foxes from the east and gray foxes from the west and they looked at their genetic variation and they found that there is a clear difference between the western and the eastern gray fox. So let me show you here, right here. Oh, so, so what you're looking at is in this phylogeny, the length of the branch represents the amount of genetic difference, right? Amount of genetic difference. You can think of that as ATCs and Gs that are different. And so the longer the branch, the more ATCs and Gs are different over the same amount of sequence. And so you look at gray foxes and you'll see like, yeah, there's variation among the gray foxes but they all group together. And so genetically you'd say like, it looks like they all share a common ancestor. Like all those sequences originally were one sequence in an individual in the past, right? Same thing Ken Ham saying, you can you, genetically, nobody was there. I don't, I never saw the original ancestor of the gray foxes in the West, but genetically it sure looks like they're all related to one another. Just as surely as you can do analysis of your family members and show they're related to your ancestors, your immediate ancestors versus somebody else on earth that doesn't have ancestry with you recently. And then there are the gray foxes in the east. So this, this data right away tells you they're not mixing between back and forth. They're not traveling back and forth and they're not, they're not uh, interbreeding with each other very much because all the ones in the west are related to each other and all the ones out of way are related to each other. And the amount of difference between the two lineages is a fair amount. Now, why do I say that? Because if you look at gray wolves, right, not gray foxes, gray wolves in North America, they're really similar to one another, even though gray wolves are, are quite divergent. I mean, they're, they're, there's a lot of diversity in gray wolves. There's less in gray wolves than there is in gray foxes. By the way, there's more variation in gray wolves than there are in human beings across the entire face of the earth. All right, and gray wolves and Mexican gray wolves are another variant of gray wolves. And then you have dogs and you see how similar all dogs are to each other, <laughs> really, really similar. And so all of these are on one different group, which, which I would consider all to be uh, wolves, all right? Canis uh, lupus. And then you have coyotes, right? And you can see coyotes and wolves are pretty similar to each other. They're actually more similar than gray foxes and from the east and the west. And that's the conclusion of this paper. The conclusion of this paper is that gray foxes in the east and the west are about a million years divergent. They've been divergent for a long time uh, and they don't really care to mate with each other. They can, if forced to, and they can produce a hybrid, but it's kind of like gray wolves and, and coyotes. They can also live in the same areas and they rarely ever mate with one another. And there really isn't any mixing between the two species. There is some, but not a great amount of mixing between the two, which is why they remain separate species. And so gray foxes in the West and the East probably really could be considered different species. You could give them different species names. Uh, also notable, gray jackal, here's the red fox. Uh, and red foxes from North America and Europe also are quite different from each other. They're as different from each other as coyotes and wolves are. So again, if you wanted to, you could probably split red foxes into different species. And then you have the Arctic fox, the kit fox. They're genetically quite different from one another and they've always been called different species. 
And so this represents a whole clade of groups of things that are kind of fox-like, right? And they all share a common ancestor. So the genetics tells you, you can kind of like trace them back to a common ancestor, a family tree. But look how far you have to go now. If you want to find the common ancestor genetically between the, the wolf types, the fox types, and the gray fox types, you're going to have to go way back. They're really, really different from one another, right? Really different from one another. And this figure right below it is showing a similar thing. Uh, and this is showing time. And so they're using time estimates. How long would it take to accumulate this many differences? Again, Ken Ham likes to talk about genetic variation, but the amount of genetic variation included in all these things right here is absolutely immense. Can't be contained in two individuals. Therefore, where did the genetic variation come from? It must have come from new mutations. It came from variants of chromosomes changing, right? Gene regulation sites changing by mutations, genes being moved around in different locations, genes being duplicated. Some of these dogs have genes the other ones don't even have, right? There's tremendous genetic variation and differences in these organisms. And to explain how you would derive all this stuff requires all the things that we understand about evolutionary theory, genetic I mean, mutations, gene flow, um, genetic drift, natural selection, acting over long periods of time, taking hundreds of thousands of generations in order to set to select on particular mutations and particular pools of genetic variants living in different environments. This isn't something that just happens in a generation or two. There's no statistics that Ken Cam can show, can point to that would show you could sort out genetic variation within a few generations and create new species, right? That's all dreamt up fantasy land. That's not based on genetics, right? Uh, this figure down here is just showing uh, relative timing. And so we're looking anywhere from half a million years to up to three or four million years for the differences. And these are just looking at the differences between gray foxes between like red foxes and other red foxes and kit foxes that's where you're getting your millions of years in even the one that's b right here three million years that's just the difference let me see that's just right here three million years if you want to go all the way back here you're looking at over 10 million years all right that's the estimate from evolutionary biology based on genetics of how long it would take to create that much genetic diversity and sort that genetic diversity into these different lineages to create these different species. That's a little out of the time frame of the 4,000 years that Ken Ham has. Uh, this is another phylogeny showing all the same things, but now what we have is uh, we have lots of different, these are all extinct organisms. These are all extinct species. Uh, I don't know if you, it's probably too small for you to see the symbol, but there's a bunch of symbols here for extinct things, right? So these are all extinct. Now, some of the extinct things, we actually have some DNA sequence if they were extinct recently. Other ones are only known from the fossil record, and you'll see like, like the last time we have a fossil of this particular lineage right here, this different genus, is five million years ago. So the, you have to go down five million years in the rock record, right, the fossil record, in order to find that particular uh, type of canine. And there are canines that go back all the way to 20-some million years old. All right, so again, uh, you have different groups of canids, which include then up here, you've got these are the foxes, All right? And these right down here, this branch right here going over here, that's the gray foxes over here. These are the gray foxes right here. And what they're estimating is that you have to go back in the fossil record about 10 million years before you find that ancestor. All right, Ken Ham's ancestor for all the different living Organ, living canines, you have to go back 10 million years to find in, in the conventional uh, geological column. Okay, so what am I saying here? What, what, what am I trying to get across to you? I'm just trying to get across that Ken Ham, he sees all these little specks in other individuals' eyes. Oh, look, you're using language like related. He complains about other creationists using the word related because if you say related, that means you're assuming 
evolutionary language, right? Those two species are related to one another. Now, if he thinks they're really related to each other because they're the same kind, he doesn't mind using the word related. He gets upset when somebody else uses the word related when he thinks those are different kinds and they're trying to put those two different kinds together. But how does he put his kinds together? Are they strictly biblical? Is he using only the word of God to determine what a biblical kind is? No, he's using genetics. He is forced to use evolutionary assumptions and principles to infer the relationships of organisms and decide this group, all these dogs species, are all one kind. And therefore, it's okay for me to believe that all these have evolved and changed and adapted uh, over time. And I don't have to call that evolution. I'm not an evolutionist because this is just what the, the variation that God allows. And he is, he, when I say he, I'm talking about all of answers in Genesis, right? It's allowed because this is just genetic variation that God gave all these, you know, these, these uh, original uh, kinds. And they're just sort of playing out that variation as they spread across the earth. And so that's just sort of filters, you know, that's filtering God's variation. And it's sort of sorting itself out into different select pools of genes. And those genes have less variation than the original uh, species had, the original ancestor had. Oh, I'm going to go back and I'm going to say, how do you know it has less variation than the original ancestor? Show me the evidence. Show it to me. Show me the original ancestor and show me how it had way more variation than the current ones. And don't show me domestic dog breeds to prove that point. Because I totally accept that domestic dog breeds have a lot less genetic variation than wolves do. All right? Domestic dogs are sorted. They are a sorting of genetic variation from wolves into smaller groups, which we have artificially selected for specific traits. But the other variation in those is, is pretty mixed up in those dogs, the, the things that we haven't selected for. And so there is less genetic variation in domesticated dogs. I agree, but that's not the way the rest of the world works, right? The amount of genetic diversity in species across the world is kind of similar. I mean, human beings actually have less genetic diversity than a lot of species do, right? A lot of species have tremendous amounts of genetic diversity. And what Kenhan needs to do is show that the, dis the ancestor of those really diverse species that are alive today had twice or three times as much genetic diversity. And I've already done other videos showing he can't show that. In fact, there's evidence that that's not the case because now we're able to sequence. We're able to sequence ancient horses. We're able to sequence ancient bears. We're able to sequence ancient dogs. We're able to sequence ancient things. And by ancient, I mean from the last ice age, from before the last ice age. And in Ken Ham's world, before the last ice age is 4,000 years ago right after they stepped off the ark, right when they should have had lots of genetic variation. And guess what all those studies show? The ancestors of today's living species don't have more genetic variation than the species do today, in general, right? There's millions of species. There are some species that don't have much variation, and there's lots of reasons for that. Lots of evolutionary reasons for that. Ken Ham is convinced that there was an ancestral dog, an ancestral canine. This ancestral canine was on Noah's Ark, stepped off Noah's Ark, and it became all these other things. And he thinks that's just genetic sorting. And what's his proof? Genetics. Genetics shows that there is a common ancestor. Right, so I believe there's a common ancestor because it kind of looks like they're all similar enough and they have similar genetics and so they all came from a common gene pool. Now, what if another creationist comes along, all right, and says, look, there's a bear, right? And Ken Ham believes that all bears, all types of bears have a common ancestor. And they say, look, look at that common ancestor, that common ancestor in the fossil record even, right? And even if you, if you recreate the original genes of that common ancestor, I just did another video where we talked about actually resurrecting uh, and recreating old 
ancestral genes and then actually testing those ancestral genes to see how fit they are compared to today. But if you were to go back and look at that ancestral genome, that ancestral genome, what if you were there, you said like, you know, that ancestral genome is pretty similar to the ancestral genome of the ancestor of dogs. And genetically, I could understand how these two have a common ancestor, right? I'm going to say there's an animal here that then had genetic diversity, which then turned into these two different gene pools. And then this gene pool turned into all these different organisms. So there's a common ancestor here. So here's what I think a kind is. I think that all of these are in the same kind. How's, how's Ken Ham going to say he's wrong about that? Like, how's Ken Ham going to deny that? He does deny that because that's, that's what he's complaining about. That's what he's complaining about, about the other young Earth evolutionists. He's saying they're encapsulating more and more and more and more evolution. They're taking the, 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 the branch deeper. Like Ken Ham's branch is already evolution. He's already imbibed evolution, accepted evolutionary patterns and evolutionary evidence in order to come to the conclusion that all canines are the same kind, right? Using evidence from God's creation, not evidence from scripture to do this. If another young earth creationist wants to use the same kind of logic and put all these together, Ken Ham can't complain about that. He might have scientific reasons why he could say, I think that's less likely or something like that. He's going to have a tough time biblically saying you can't do that because he's opened up the floodgates. He has opened up the slippery slope to young earth evolution. The point of this, and this is from my paper as well, and my co-author came up with this uh, figure. Let me, let me delete this. Uh, it's a great figure. And it, it really illustrates the problem for young earth creationists uh, and why young earth evolutionists are, I think, see, I actually have a way of seeing this much better than Ken Ham does, who, again, judges a book by its cover. But that's why I love this figure, because if Ken Ham really does judge books by their cover and, he, and he's consistent, he should run into a little problem for himself. Here are um, artistic renditions of what fossils may have looked like from what is generally considered to be the common ancestors of these different carnivore groups, right? Cats, dogs, bears, red pandas, uh, mong mongooses, and so forth. Now, do you notice anything similar about all these common ancestors? They're all pretty similar, aren't they? Right? Every time that a paleo artist has, looks at the fossils from these ancient groups, like the, like the oldest member that we can identify that we think is a dog, and the oldest member we think that is a bear. And then we kind of like, here's what it would have looked like. They all kind of look the same. And I'm sorry, but if I took Ken Ham back in a time capsule and I showed him these animals walking around, right, on some continent, and I asked him, are they different kinds or are they the same kind? Ken Ham be like, oh, th those are just different variations of the same kind. Right? He doesn't know that they're going to become all these really different looking things that he thinks look different and aren't the same kind. He's going to look at them and be like, eh, those are all the same kind. And guess what? If he even tried to use a genetic argument and he went in and he did the genomes of these, the genomes of all these are going to be really similar to one another. They're going to look like they're the genomes of members of the same family. The thing is, those genomes have changed so much since then that they now truly do encapsulate really large differences between the genomes of these living relatives and these living relatives look quite different. But if you look at the ancestral genomes, these two genomes are really not much different than these two genomes are from each other. So Ken Ham would have to change his view of what a kind is back in the past if he didn't actually see what walked off the ark or he didn't actually see what God made, right? He'd be using criteria that he's using today. He would come to different conclusions about the extent of a kind. So he says there's no common ancestor of all these today. But I think if he were around 4,000 years ago and his view was correct of the origin of species, he might actually put all these together into one kind. And I foresee a day in which really there will be some young earth creationists that will suggest that there was a common ancestor carnivore on the ark. That carnivore got off the ark and then diversified into all these different groups.
Because after all, you can just say, Ken Ham could just say, there's a huge amount of variation of that ancestral carnivore that was on the ark. After it got off, it diversified into all of these things, right, that are different from each other. They're selected out some of that gene pool. And then each one of those continued to diversify into new habitats, creating the families that we have today. But in fact, they're all the same kind. And Ken Ham today would say that person's a heretic and a danger to young earth creationism. Right. But he would also, if we transported Ken Ham back in time 300 years ago and told him that somebody was trying to tell you that all these are the same kind that came from a common ancestor, he would call them a heretic and a young earth evolutionist. Right. <laughs> so the goalposts have shifted for creationists. And Ken Ham is trying to establish a particular goalpost and say, this is where I'm at, and anyone who goes beyond this point is in danger land. What I'm saying is, Ken Ham's already entered that land. He just doesn't recognize that he's on the other side of the fence. Uh, yeah. Let's quit for a day on that. I was, I mean, there's there's going to be lots of other ways to say this in the future, but this is my attempt to look at canines and show how inconsistent Ken Ham is with his own language about what young earth evolutionists are doing. Thanks for listening. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.